Good evening. How are you today? I hope you've had a good day. Um, it's evening where I am. It could be morning where, I, where you are and what you're doing today, and that's just fine. So what have we been learning about? Remember, you've been learning about the classification or sorting of animals. So how do animals classify or sort animals? Do you remember our mnemonic? Mnemotic, I can't say it. All my best friends represent vertebrates. Do you remember that sentence that we've said? All my best friends represent vertebrates. Can you name the five animal groups that we can remember when we say that? All is amphibians. My mammals best birds friends fish represent reptiles and all of those groups are vertebrate groups you remember a vertebrate is an animal with a backbone or spine that's right so what types of characteristics do scientists use to classify animals into these groups some of the main ideas are cold-blooded and warm-blooded and vertebrate or invertebrate. So I'm going to ask you a couple riddles. I think you can get these. We just have five. See if you can get these animal groups. I breathe oxygen using lungs. I have hard, scaly skin. I lay eggs in nests. Some examples of animals that are in my group are lizards and snakes. What group of animals am I? Reptiles, you're right. Number two, I do not have a spine. I am a group that makes up most of the animals on earth, including insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and many other types of animals. What group of animal am I? The key is I do not have a spine. I am an invertebrate. That's right. At the beginning of my life, I am an aquatic animal and breathe using gills. But as I grow, I slowly develop lungs and morph into a water and land animal. What group of animals am I? That's right, I am an amphibian. Next one, I have three classes, bony, cartilaginous, and jawless, and I am cold-blooded. What group of animals am I? This one's a little tough. You can have a bony one of these, a cartilaginous one of these, or a jawless one of these. It's a fish. I am a classification of animals that is made up of amphibians, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles that all have backbones. What group of animals am I? Vertebrates, that's right. So in our last lesson, we learned more about reptiles. Do you remember how we would classify reptiles? What are some of the characteristics that they have? Reptiles have hard, scaly skin. That's number one, so put a finger up. They lay eggs in nests on land, and they breathe air through lungs. That's at least three things, and there are more. Well, in today's Read Aloud, we're going to read about a different group. And you can see one of these groups right here. Hello, folks. It's me, Rattenboro, once again. If you recall, you learned all about reptiles last time. How exciting that was. Can you remember which group of animals you're going to be hearing about today? Birds. I can't wait to tell you all about my friend Ebenezer. I met him on the continent of Africa. Before I tell you about him, I thought we would begin today's lesson by quickly reviewing how Paolo, Tabitha, and Anna are related to each other. Remember, just because they don't look the same, they do have quite a bit in common, beginning with the fact that they are all members of the animal kingdom.
I brought along special, special diagrams of their skeletons to help you. Can you tell which skeleton belongs to which animal? What common characteristic is visible in all three? Yes, all three of them have backbones. So as you probably recall, scientists classify them as vertebrates. You're right, you have to know that. Vertebrates are animals that have a backbone. Um, we're not going to spend too much time talking about their internal body temperatures today, but now you should know that none of them have constant body temperatures. Paolo, Tabitha, and Anna are all cold-blooded and their temperature changes depending on their surroundings. That makes two characteristics that all three of them hold in common. The fact that they are all vertebrates and the fact that they are all cold-blooded animals. So now let's see where Ebenezer Egret fits in. We know that he belongs to the animal group classified as birds. Um, are birds vertebrates? Are they? Look, <laughs> that is a long backbone. Ebenezer has a strong backbone that reaches all the way up his long neck and supports his head. His bony skeleton is very important. His bones are extremely light weight with lots of air cavities or hollow places inside them to help him fly. So what does cavity mean? Let me read that again and you tell me what cavity means. His bones are extremely lightweight with lots of air cavities or hollow places inside them to help him fly. A cavity is a hollow place. You're right. He uses his muscular legs to push off the ground and then his wings take over. The weight and arrangement of his bones help him soar through the air. Here's a picture of the bone that really is mostly hollow. There's a big cavity in there, mostly air space. Okay. Birds are the lucky ones, aren't they? Look how pretty. How many of you have ever wished that you could fly? Mm, I just raised my hand. I do like very much being a rat, but sometimes I think it would be great fun to fly. Ebenezer is very graceful, isn't he? So far you have learned in detail about cold-blooded animals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Do you think Ebenezer and all birds are cold-blooded too? Hmm. Scientists classify birds as warm-blooded because their internal body temperature remains constant no matter where they fly. Birds have several characteristics that enable them to fly, but being warm-blooded is essential to flight. They have a very high metabolism as only warm-blooded animals do. Metabolism is the process which produces energy in most animals' bodies. Let me say that again. Metabolism is the process which produces energy in most animals' bodies. When we speak about the high metabolism of birds, we're speaking about the fact that they have a steady flow of energy that helps them maintain a high level of activity required by flight. The higher the activity level of an animal, the higher its metabolism is likely to be. What this means when it comes to eating is that they need lots of food to maintain that energy. Have you ever heard the saying, somebody eats like a bird for somebody who eats very small amounts of food at one time? Well, Ebenezer told me that an important thing to remember about this expression is that it does not mean that birds do not eat very much food. In fact, Ebenezer and birds like him need to eat two times their body weight in food every day because they have such a high metabolism and burn lots more energy than most animals. Of course, there are lots of small meals a day for birds, quite unlike Anna Anaconda, who sometimes eats only one big meal in a period of many days. So 
Someone who eats like a bird is usually someone who picks at their food and only eats small bites at a time, but might eat all day long. What is the primary source of energy for organisms like you and me? The sun. You may have learned about food chains and cycles in nature. You may learn more about food chains in the ecology domain at the end of third grade. Green plants capture the sun's energy and it's transferred to the animals when they eat the plants or plant eating animals. Energy from the sun powers everything we do on Earth. The primary source of energy for organisms on the Earth is the sun. Plants use the sun directly. Animals either use plants directly or they can eat other animals that use plants directly. That's a food chain. Energy from the sun powers everything we do on earth. Unlike cold-blooded animals that depend upon their surroundings to regulate internal body temperatures, warm-blooded animals are able to, able to produce heat for energy within their own bodies. They can travel farther and live in more extreme conditions than cold-blooded animals. However, because cold-blooded animals have a much lower metabolism, they do not need as much energy to stay alive. Remember what I just said about the eating habits of Ebenezer compared to Anna? The only warm-blooded animals that are able to go without food for long periods of time are hibernating animals. That's because their metabolism slows way down when they are hibernating and they require less energy to stay alive. So, like all birds, Ebenezer is warm-blooded, and he's a vertebrate with lightweight bones to help him fly. Look at this image and describe some of the other physical characteristics that help scientists classify Ebenezer at a bird, as a bird. Well, of course, you're going to begin with his wings. Ebenezer has wings, and wings are essential to flight. The shape of a bird's wings determines how far and how high a bird can fly, in addition to the lightweight, its lightweight bones. Remember those bones have air cavities in them, air holes? Mm -hmm. Here are two birds to compare, very different, although similar in many ways. Look at this picture of an American bald eagle. His long, broad wings are built so that he can glide or move smoothly and continuously. He can soar great distances, traveling up to 65 miles per hour. Compare the eagle's wings to the tiny tapered wings of a hummingbird, one of the smallest birds on earth. His wings beat rapidly, 20 or more beats per second, as he hovers or floats and flutters in midair. So their wings are built for different jobs. Wow, look at how beautiful. Um, what else helps Ebenezer and all birds fly? Feathers are also a great help, serving as lightweight coverings for their wings. So you have to have wings, but they have to be covered with feathers. That's right. So that's really two items. These feathers mesh together as their wings flap downward, parting again to let air through as their wings sweep upward again. Feathers also acts as insulation. Insulation is an extra layer that protects birds' skin from the sun and traps in heat and provides energy and warmth in the winter months. The point of the feather where it is attached to the bird's body is also called a quill. All birds have feathers and no other animals do. So if you spot a feathered friend, you may assume that it is a bird. Because their precious feathers take quite a beating, birds take good care of them and often preen them with their beaks to keep them clean, waterproof, in the right position, and zippered up. Take a look at Ebenezer's beak. 
Isn't it a beauty? Not all birds have such long beaks. Why do you think his is so long? Think about where he lives and what he eats. A bird's beak is clearly tied to where they live and what they eat. Well, his beak is so long because it is a terrific hunting weapon. He uses the end of his beak to grab small prey such as snails, crayfish in the surface waters of the marshland and to spear larger prey such as frogs, snakes, and even fish on marshy wetlands. Appearing in many different shapes and sizes, beaks are often used to identify birds. Their main function is for feeding. So a bird's beak can provide scientists with clues to a bird's eating habits. Take a look at this finch's beak. This is a finch and it's long and thin. Depending on where you live, you may have seen a finch at your bird feeder. They use their beaks to crack open seeds. Next time you see a bird, take a look at his beak and see if you can guess what it eats. Does it eat fish? Does it eat seeds? Insects? Nuts? Mice? Nectar? What do birds eat? Oops. Birds' feet are another clue to different bird habitats and lifestyles. Hawks have long talons or claws to catch their prey. Waders have long legs because they're in the water. These are waders, those are talons. Um, woodpeckers have feet adapted to climbing trees. Here's a sweet little, I think it's a downy. Perching birds have single hind or rear toe for grasping branches. Do you see he's got one toe in the back and three in the front? And ducks and geese have webbed feet for swimming. Birds are the only group of animal that give birth by only one means. There are fascinating pattern breakers in all of the other groups, but all birds lay eggs. There are no pattern breakers. Their eggs are yolk filled and have hard calcified shells. They need to be incubated or kept warm so the parent sits on them until they hatch. This can be a dangerous because sitting birds are prime targets for predators. Most birds prepare a nest or shelter for their young using whatever materials are available to them in nature. Some make nests from twigs and straw. Others build nests of mud. Woodpeckers create cavities. Ooh, there's that word again. It means a hollow space. Woodpeckers create cavities in trees, whereas kingfishers bore into riverbanks. These nests provide safe havens or safe places protecting both the eggs and the baby chicks from harsh weather and animal predators. Some birds like chickens are able to see, walk and feed themselves almost immediately after hatching. However, many birds are born in a very immature stage and require a lengthy period of parental care. These are kingfishers that have dug holes in the banks Woodpeckers, that's a pileated woodpecker. Um, robins, looks like a robin. And some kind of hmm, swallow that makes a mud nest. <laughs> we spent lots of time today talking about what helps birds fly? Strong muscles, light bones, powerful wings, and airy feathers. But did you know that in spite of having all those things in common, some birds are still unable to fly? Flightless birds include the largest bird on earth, the ostrich, with a seven foot wingspan. It seems odd that ostriches can't fly, but they hold records for being both the fastest bird on land and the fastest two-legged animal on earth. 
able to run up to 40 miles per hour. Australian emus, also, this is an emu, large fl flightless birds, look a lot like ostriches and often travel long distances to find food. Penguins are perhaps the most endearing and affection inspiring of all flightless birds. They march upright like people as they move around in their habitat. These aquatic birds of the Southern Hemisphere waddle along on their short legs and webbed feet down to the sea. Their wings serve as flippers to carry them swiftly through Arctic waters, traveling up to 15 miles an hour. Uh -oh. It's beautiful. Birds live all over the world in cool, wet rainforests, along ocean shores, in dark, dense evergreens, in hot, dry deserts, and on the banks of lakes, rivers, and streams. Some birds travel long distance, migrating to warmer homes in winter, whereas others are homebodies, never straying very far from where they are born. Some can swim, others can fly. Some enchant us with their songs, whereas, as, whereas others shout, caw, caw. Birds come in all different shapes and sizes, but all birds are warm-blooded, egg-laying vertebrates with feathers and wings. Birds are very different from the animals we will study next time. So far, you've learned about fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. Fish, amphibians, reptiles are all cold-blooded, and birds are warm-blooded. That's some kind of scrub jay. I'm not sure what this sort of looks like a magpie, but I'm not sure. A puffin and a roadrunner. Very interesting, very different, but all birds. Let's go over some of our questions. Birds live all over the world in different habitats. What are some of those habitats? Well, looking right here, you can tell. This is a jungle. This is ocean, so near the ocean, in a forest, hot desert, okay? So near lakes and rivers and streams and oceans, in the dense evergreens, wet rainforests, and dry deserts. What body, body part do birds have that enable them to fly? They have wings, that's right. Bird bones have lots of cavities in them, which help make them lighter and able to fly. What are cavities? Hollow places in the bones. You can call them holes, really. Cavities are holes, holes in the bones. What is the job of the feathers on a bird? Well, feathers provide insulation and waterproofing to protect the skin and trap heat. They help birds fly by being lightweight and by meshing together and parting, which pushes against the air and lets it through. In addition to cavities in their bones, birds must also have a high metabolism in order to fly. Why is a high metabolism important for birds? A high metabolism provides a steady flow of energy in order for birds to be highly active. Describe the difference between the way a hummingbird flies and an eagle flies. Well, a hummingbird beats its wings very, very fast and an eagle glides or soars. Why do birds build nests? for protection for their young and for homes. And what are the different types of nests that you heard about? Twigs and straw, mud, cavities or holes in riverbanks or cavities and holes in riverbanks. Cavities in trees, cavities in riverbanks. Can you tell me the characteristics that classify an animal as a bird? Warm-blooded, vertebrate, has wings with feathers, 
builds nests, lays eggs. Okay, so there are five things. Okay, let's say them again. Warm-blooded, vertebrate, has wings with feathers, builds nest, and lays eggs. Okay. A friend tells you that an ostrich is not a bird because it cannot fly. How would you convince your friend that an ostrich is a bird? Well, you're going to tell them the characteristics of a bird and you're going to tell them the characteristics of an ostrich. Okay. An ostrich is warm blooded. An ostrich is a vertebrate. It has feathers and wings. It makes nests and it lays eggs. Okay, it is a pattern breaker because it does not fly, but every bird has feathers, wings, and lays eggs. Okay. All right, tomorrow we will come back and read some more. Thank you for joining.